Okay, so let's get our tests passing. You, may, may, I, ho I hope I haven't bored you too much. This is obviously a long process, this test, and then set up the project due to the DLLs and the libs and get all that figured out. Um, you just Chances are, if you ended up on this channel, you just want to get in there and start making games, which if you do, there's probably better channels for you. If you really want to understand how an engine works and how to do it correctly and cleanly and from the ground up, that's my goal with these sets of videos. Uh, the the game is kind of secondary to this. The, even though the game's important, the game's fun. We'll do some really cool, flashy things. We're working up to that, and, and we're doing it roughly as fast as I can. But I'm trying to explain all these fine details, and I definitely want to test as much as possible. We probably won't test every single thing, but test as much as possible. Let's get these tests working. Uh, go back to clock H. Here's the interface. Initialize, shut down, new frame. Remember, we're going to send our clock through some states here. We initialize and that's when we're going to start timing time and then when we hit the new frame, every time we call new frame, new frame, new frame, new frame like that, uh, we decided, and we should document this with comments, The every time we call new frame, this time elapsed last frame is going to give us the delta distance in time between the frames. So you could really think of it as as uh, when new frame, when we call new frame right here, and then the, we do all of our work, and then the next frame comes, and we call new frame, the delta is this distance right here. Okay, and same story right here as this distance. Uh, ideally, the time between uh, when a frame ends and the time between a new frame starts computing, that's going to be very small, but it does exist, and we're going to measure that entire time right there. That, this this time we're considering to be part of our delta time even though it should be rather small. So that's our goal here and that's what we tested for. I'm gonna go back to clock test off CPP and just kinda get, a, get an idea. It's been a little while since we looked at this so I wanna, wanna where's my initialize here? Initialize, call new frame. So it looks like I'm not even testing what initialize is gonna do. We don't know well, the time between initialize and the time between new frame doesn't look like we are testing anything for that. So let's just assume that's going to be uh, zero or the time of a current frame. We should probably define that but and test for it. Initialize. First of all, our clock class, we got to store one of those large integers here. So large integer. It doesn't show up. Do you know why? <laughs> we don't have any includes here. We probably should include uh, do the includes to make this work. So what is the include for large integer? That can be solved with a simple Google large integer, integer, and large integer union windows. What is the include? Include. Include with windows.h. Remember, windows.h is what we use to get the query high performance counter as well. So we're going to, I hesitate to include such a big header file inside of another header file, but it looks like it's going to be a necessary evil. So let's do that. Pound include. Come on include windows.h. It's already part of our search path. Large integer. Uh, let's say time last frame. That's what we'll call it. So when we call initialize here, let's do the vertical tab group thing. New vertical tab group. Let's say bool b gets... Actually, you know what? We'll do return Query performance frequency. That's something else we need to do is store the frequency. If you read up on frequency, you may think, oh, the number of clock ticks we're getting per second could change from one second to another, and especially if I plug in my computer and I unplug it and that sort of thing. But I was looking at the, doc the documentation, and it says that it will not ever change until you reboot your computer. And chances are when you reboot your computer, it still won't change. So we're okay to query the performance frequency and just use it once. That may be why, remember back when we were querying this before, we weren't getting the perfect samples for what my computer is, because my computer, when I plug it in, I notice it goes a lot faster than when I unplug it, and it's just the, this power settings there. But we'll still get the same performance frequency here, even though the underlying frequency may be changing. Okay, so time last frame, large integer. Now I could, I could query the performance frequency every time I needed it, but I don't want to. Uh, let's say frequency, time, frequency. I don't want to. If I can store it away, and this is only 64 bits, if I can store this value away and not have to eat the cost for calling this function over and over again, then 
I will. So query performance frequency. Let's say bool b gets query performance frequency, address of time frequency. All right. If not b, return false. And I should actually log an error here, but we don't have a logging system set up quite quite yet. We'll do that in a future video. And then I think we'll define time last frame right here. I want to do a few things. I want to say b gets query performance counter. I'm going to check both of these. I know if I can query the performance frequency, chances are I can also query the counter. But right here in initialize, I just want to make sure I can do both. So I'm just going to test it real quick. Address time last frame. All right. And uh, let's just return b at that point. Okay. In fact, I could go as short as saying return that. The reason I I made I even made B here. This looks a little interesting, I know, but I'd say, hey, if if we can't query the performance frequency, then let's just not continue on. But if we can query this, then let's query this. And if this returns false, then I'll tell you it returned false. Otherwise, it's going to return true. So a lot of people get kind of eerie when I do this double return thing. It's a programming trick I use, and I don't feel that bad about it. Where did my closing curly brace go? Did I delete it while I was looking? Okay, shut down. There's really nothing to do in the shutdown, so we're just going to we're gonna return true. Yes, we shut down cleanly, and I'm actually going to format this a little bit just so it doesn't take up so much room. Uh, new frame. Okay, when they call new frame, we want to store the amount of time that happened last frame, and we want to get the current frame, or the current time. So this time last frame, let me draw this back up again. We have a frame, we have a frame, we have a frame, and our time last frame marks this spot right here. Then time goes on, and then we move time last frame to this spot right here. Then time goes on, and we move time last frame to this spot right here. And so time last frame, it's not going to store this delta here. It's just storing where we're currently at in time, and that's our measurement. So we need a variable to store the delta as well. Let's let's put that over here. Let's zoom this out a little bit. Get some screen space. Large integer. I'm going to call it delta last frame. Okay, so new frame. Large integer this time query performance counter address of this time and then I'm going to say large integer delta gets this time dot quad part is it, yep quad part minus time last frame dot quad part. That's going to give us the number of ticks. You know what? Notice I, <laughs> I'm not used to working with this union too much. Delta. This return quad part returns a long, long. Uh, this quad part returns a long, long. A long, long minus a long, long is not a large integer. So I actually have to put a semicolon here and say delta dot quad part gets the quad part subtracted. Okay, so this is going to take the difference of those frames. Okay, here's a frame, here's a frame, and here's our our time last frame. We put it there. Time goes by, we get to the beginning of the next frame, and so we've just subtracted. This time is right here. So if I take this time minus our our previous time, our time last frame, then that's going to give us this. Let's see what's a nice color here. We'll do black. It's going to give us this delta here. All right. Now, notice we're not we 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 need to return time lapsed to frame of time elapsed last frame as a float eventually. So I'm actually going to store that as a float. Float uh delta what should we call it? Delta delta time. That's a good one. Delta time. And we just know that delta time is our last delta. Now, why am I switching to a float? Well, first of all, a lot of calculations we like to do in game are going to use floats, and the operators 
for a large integer are are not defined. All right, then we we can subtract these long longs and things. And but I don't want in our inside our games when I'm dealing with time. I just want to use floats, and those floats will mean seconds. Okay. Now there's issues with floats, and I'll talk about those in a later suite of videos when we talk about time in depth. But for now, I just want to use floats and return a float. And we're we're okay using floats for short amounts of times. This is a key concept you need to get in your head. We're we're okay to use floats for short amount of times, but we're not okay to use floats for large amount of times. All right. A delta time is going to be very small, underneath less than a second, much less more much more or less than a second. So it's okay to use floats for that. And then I also don't want to couple our code to using large integers. Say I want to port this to a different platform, a non-Windows platform. Well, large integer is a Windows platform, so I'd have to go around and patch up everywhere where I do large integer. Whereas float, it's pretty standard. In fact, I should probably type def this to a generic float that we could retype def to something else on a different platform. So internally inside here, we're going to use in large integers, but interfacing with the outside world, we're going to switch to floats. Well, now that I have my delta here between the last frame and the current frame, I'm going to I'm gonna go to a float now. So let's say float delta time. So let's say delta time gets, and we'll need to do some casting here, float this time, dot, or not this time, delta dot quad part divided by the time frequency time frequency dot quad part so I cast this left hand operand to a float that's going to take this large integer and represent it as a float and then the compiler will implicitly cast the right side to a float perform the division for us via uh, via float division and return a float which we can store in delta time all right, after we've done that, there's one last thing we need to do. We need to catch our our last frame time to the current time. We need to move move this guy forwards here. So time last frame dot quad part gets this time dot quad part. All right, and then time elapsed last frame, that's going to be easy. We just return delta time. All right, hopefully my logic makes sense to you and Seems to make sense to me, not very much code here, but, but let's see if we can uh, pass the test, get the test working, um, that sort of thing. I wouldn't be surprised if I have some error logic in here. You're probably watching the video, and if I have some errors in there, you're probably screaming out, Jamie, you got an error there. Unfortunately, you cannot talk to me. I'm programming solo, but very often I love programming in front of students and things like that because they'll point out my mistakes as we go along and that goes back to a good argument for supporting pair programming in industry but anyway I'm rambling now and the video is long enough let's let's see let's see if this test passes our tests and see where my logic may or may not be off